talk that's separating you from lunch, so I, prom I promise I won't uh, go over uh, too long here. But what we're going to talk about today is uh, nonprofits. And one of the things I want to ask you before you even get started is how many of you have actually thought about working in a nonprofit as a job or a career? A couple of you. Why? Are you going to? I'm not sure. Not sure? <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Uh, no particular reason. I'm just really unsure. What it's legitimate. Well, let's talk about why people, generally speaking, don't. And the folks in your shoes, I know very few alums of informatics and computer science that have actually gone to work in nonprofits. And there's some reasons why. So the reason is that you don't see them at the career fair for the most part, at least not the smaller ones. Um, and the reason being is that the highest paying jobs aren't in the nonprofit sector. They're in, in private life, right? You want to be, everybody wants to be the consultant. It goes, you know, that travels 80% of the time and, and takes, you know, you want to be the first person to get that six-figure salary, right? So you're not going to find that for the most part in the nonprofit sector. In fact, nonprofits don't have the extra money to even send people to career fairs in, in some cases. They couldn't spend the money. Most of the ones that we work with um, here, in, here locally don't even have the money to be able to do that. Um, but some of the most rewarding experiences you'll ever have or could ever have are with a nonprofit. They do work that no one else does. They have a direct impact on life, and these, these jobs really are very rewarding. So let's look at why this is the case, why it is that you don't see a whole lot of technologists in nonprofits, and how you can change that, potentially. So IT isn't, isn't the highest priority in nonprofits, to say the least. And um, they tend to have infrastructures that are on the poor end, they don't have the bright, brand new MacBook Pros and the iMac 27-inch machines sitting on desks. Um, and there's reasons why. There's two major reasons, and one of them is, is funding issues, the other one is staffing expertise. So let me talk about, I'm gonna talk about this slide for, for a few minutes here, because uh, this is really the heart of why nonprofits don't have money to spend on technology. Because what happens with nonprofits is they're graded on how much of the money they take in goes directly into services. So for example, if I'm Middleway House here in Bloomington, Indiana, and I get a grant of $100,000 from some agency, whether it's the government or some charitable foundation or whatever the case may be, I've got to show that about 90% or more of that money goes directly into funding programs. So um, taking care of women, so doing training programs or providing meals or something along those lines. You get about 10% overhead for administrative costs, so for the salaries of the people that are working there, for the, um, uh, for the infrastructure that you have in place. If you drop below that 90% or whatever it may be for that funding agency, what happens? They don't fund you anymore because you're not putting all that money, you're not putting a high enough percentage of that money back into direct, directly into service. Does that make sense? So what happens is nonprofits feel like, gosh, we've got to keep that percentage up so we can't invest in IT infrastructure. We can't hire someone who's a technologist on staff unless that's directly contributing to some kind of program that we're doing. Does that make sense? So this is this whole vicious cycle feeds on itself, and it's why most of the nonprofits that, that we know, um, small local ones definitely, um, don't have the resources to spend on new machines or on hiring people to come in and do work for them. Okay? Most of the work that has to be done has to be donated by some person, whether it's someone working, you know, someone who's, uh, who has some kind of a business or knows something about technology is willing to donate some time and effort, whether it's from service learning classes at IU or some kind of an internship position that generally speaking is going to be unpaid. All right? The other issue is that most staff members just really don't have the expertise. They have the job at a nonprofit not because of the money. They don't do it for the money. They don't make a whole lot of money in general. They do it because they have a passion for what it is they're doing, right? So someone who's working at Shalom Center has a passion for seeing that folks that are destitute and homeless have a place where they can spend the day and feel like they have a home for, for at least part of the day have a place where they can take a shower, where they can um, sleep for a couple hours because they couldn't sleep that night because they were up all night trying to protect their stuff. Does that make sense? So you get a lot of folks in the nonprofit industry that are passionate about what they're doing and they'll take lower salaries to be in that 
organization because they have some kind of personal connection or passion for what it is they do. Okay? They don't do it for the money. And because of the funding issues we talked about before, there's rarely any in-house technical staff. They don't have that IT person that can that, that's kind of the the uh, the jack of all trades that can do a little server administration. They can they can work on the website. They can fix machines that are going down. They can you know install software or look at what maybe some options are for new software that's coming down the pipe. They don't have that person. What you might have is someone who has no technical training whatsoever, but because they know a little bit, they become the de facto technical person for that particular nonprofit. A lot of times they're out of the water. I mean, Anthony's one of my, my IT um, interns here. It has been this third semester. Um, he's been with us from the very beginning, and he's smiling and laughing because he saw at Middleway House, for example, the IT, the tech savvy person there, she's running, she's working on a laptop that's almost 10, 10 years old. Or, I mean, desktop that's almost 10 years old. She has no formal training whatsoever. Um, she kind of got stuck in that role without any, I mean, her, law, her knowledge is a little bit higher than everybody else's, but it's still less than what I would expect from a freshman in I-101 at the end of the semester, right? Even halfway through the semester, okay? Um, so they, it's hard for them to get money for infrastructure. They don't have the expertise on staff. So what is it they need? Well, nonprofits have the same needs that a for-profit has, right? They need a website. They need databases to store information. Um, they need all these things. Um, I can tell you that one of the biggest things we do the most uh, in, the, in the clinic is build websites. That's a really easy, kind of low-hanging fruit. Almost everybody needs a new website because they've got someone that was a volunteer that, that decided that they wanted to build a website for them. And it's like almost like having your grandmother build a website. Anybody done that? I mean, you look at these websites, and they're pretty horrible. Now, in some cases, they've had some folks that know what they're doing, and so they make websites that aren't so bad. But a lot of these look like they're made by by someone who knows really nothing about, about technology, because yeah, it really is true. Some organizations that are larger, such as like Boys and Girls Club, for example, they have a national organization. They have technologists at st on staff, but at the national level, not on the local level. So they have someone that can manage a central web server for all of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and they'll help individual clubs, but that's one person or, or a very small team of people trying to split their time among the hundreds or even thousands of clubs that are throughout the, 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 uh, the, the country. So um, websites, low-hanging fruit, everybody seems to always need new websites. Um, databases. Middleway House does everything they do. So everybody know what Middleway House is? So it's in a battered women's shelter here in, in Bloomington. They provide short and long-term housing for women and their dependents. It's a really great program. They've got a brand new facility that they were able to, to, to get to some loan money for, and it's a beautiful area. They do everything on paper. So every time anybody comes in, they have to fill out a form. Anytime anybody receives any kind of counseling, or they go, they, 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 uh, they, they go and, and enter a program, or they have to report on something, it all is on paper. So what do they do at the end of the reporting period, the month, or the, or the year? The staff members spend days or even weeks going through all this paper and compiling those reports they need. They're losing literally months of staff time over the course of a year just trying to, to figure out where it is, try to get that data digitized in a form that they can actually report back on their grants or to the funding agencies or to the regula regulatory agencies. So databases are very important because honestly they don't have them. In a lot of cases. Um, one thing that we found that a lot of nonprofits need and a lot of them don't even know they need is a social media policy. They don't know how to get the word out there using Facebook or Twitter or any of these other social media um, uh, um, methods. So they might have an intern that's there, unpaid, that maybe you know is tweeting about stuff, but if you know anything about social media, you have to have an organizational policy and a vision for what that, that social media is supposed to say, or it can come back to bite you in the butt. And I'm sure you've all heard about you know, uh, wayward tweets or Facebook posts that get people in trouble. That's the problem is that you have an intern who doesn't really know much about what your organization is doing, trying to do your social media or updating your Facebook or even updating your website, 
and they don't know what the message really should be, that needs to come from the leadership within the nonprofit. And so we see a lot of, of disconnect of people not really knowing that this is what the, is really the way it should be. Almost every nonprofit we work with ha, is in dire need of hardware and software. Um, like I said, we've got Middleway House where some of them are using machines that are almost a decade old. Uh, Boys and Girls Club has a computer lab that four years ago was great. There was a grant that came through from the School of Education um, and they put 17 machines, brand new machines, all in at once. Four years later, what's happened to those machines? They're starting to fall apart. There was no central administration and they never had a plan for how to replace those machines on a, on a yearly cycle. The vast majority of nonprofits we work, we work with have no budget for IT. They don't have a plan for for fixing or replacing these, these machines on a regular basis. At IU, almost every lab machine that you see is replaced on the three or four year cycle, right? They move them out, they surplus it, they even get a little bit of money back. Nonprofits are buying those surplus machines because they're so cheap, and they're, but they're already four years old. Are they getting a lot of good use out of it? And the answer is no. Um, so on a hardware cycle, they don't replace anything. It's that whole, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of philosophy. Because they, they really don't have the budget. They've never actually said, we need to set aside X number of dollars every year to kind of to, to make sure that our infrastructure keeps going. So when something breaks, nonprofits generally tend to have to scramble around, trying to get some extra money somewhere to pay for whatever it was that broke. All right. And that doesn't even answer, that doesn't even talk about the, the question of how many hours of staff time do they lose every year because their machines are so old it takes forever to do anything, right? Think about that. We're, we're, we're all used to pretty fast machines on our campus. If something takes more than a few seconds to load, we're pissed, right? It's wasting our time. We're sitting there, we're impatient. Imagine if it takes five minutes for your machine to even boot up mm -hmm. or, or one or two minutes for any kind of, of, of application to actually start up. And that's the reality of it for a lot of folks. We work with Shalom Center, and they have no original bought equipment in the, the entire place. All of their machines are donated secondhand. Um, tech support. So once they get the machines, they need someone that can keep them running. Unfortunately, that's not, generally speaking not the case. Um, system and network administration, we go in and, and or they need folks that understand how to arrange a network in such a way that they can monitor it and, and that it meets the needs of the organization. They need folks that can actually go in and, um, and set up individual systems in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, they desperately need staff training. We found that, that a lot of staff members in nonprofits, they know the basics of Word or Excel but they really don't know how to do a lot of the things that they should be able to do um, because they were never trained in this, right? Again, no, little to no technical training. And if you, and Excel can be a pretty scary beast for someone who's never worked with it before beyond just filling in the little squares and maybe doing a, a you know, highlighting and doing a sum, right? Um, mobile applications, we're, we're, we're gonna be working with a, a group this fall, it's a school that got some iPads in and they don't know how to use them. They got a grant for some iPads and they, they're unsure how to effectively use them to teach. So we're gonna try and work with them to figure out what are some applications we can build and how can we make this work for them. And then just in general consulting advice, where can we go to store our documents? How do we do backups? How can we set up our processes and procedures in our, in our office that makes sense and that takes advantage of, of perhaps the the, you know, leverages the newest technologies or newer technologies that can do it better than we're already doing it. I see at some of these nonprofits, their idea of a backup is sticking a USB thumb drive in their machine and, and just saving their mission critical data to a thumb drive. Or better yet, they email a document to themselves. That's how they store their, their mission critical documents. And that's just not gonna work, all right? So why should you get involved? Well, it's a great opportunity to give back to the community. There's no better feeling than when you go in and, and, and work with, with a nonprofit and you've made a difference in the way that they provide a service or someone comes up to you and says, hey, that really meant a lot to me. It's the most rewarding thing that you're probably gonna, that you would experience in college or even outside of college, obviously. Um, you make a significant impact on other people's lives and don't look at, so that's great. 
one of the, the key things for you if you're looking for that job in a consulting firm is that it gives you real world experience. You can take what you've learned and develop new skills or hone those skills in a real world job setting. You're going to learn technical skills and you're also going to learn those soft skills. How to interact with a client. Understanding how that nonprofit works and then taking that understanding and translating it into a, an IT plan. Those are some things that are nowhere else can you get that kind of training. So how do you get involved? Well, here at IU there are lots of ways for you to get involved. Um, the first one is just volunteer with, the, with a, an agency. There are lots of places. There are over 200 nonprofits in the local in the Monroe County area. Over 200, and they're always looking for for, for volunteers, right? So you can volunteer directly with them and say, you know, you look at their needs and say, oh hey, you need a website. Well, I can make you a basic website. Here you go. You can explore internships. So some of these these places might have an internship, or there are actually grants that you can write to work for a nonprofit for the summer as an intern. And that's a great experience right there. If you can write a grant and, and win a grant, you get paid for doing the work, which is great, nice. And you're actually helping the nonprofit as well. So it's a real nice win-win situation for everybody involved, if you can do that. Another option are project-based service learning classes. There is a really good service learning program here on campus. And there are literally dozens of classes throughout IU that teach by putting you in touch with a nonprofit and doing project-based work or just basically volunteering and learning about how that nonprofit works. Those are all great options. And if you're interested in that, please come talk to me and I can point you in the direction of where to, to look for those kinds of classes. And then there's ServeIT. And this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my half an hour or so that I have to talk to you. Um, we're going to tell you how our approach, to, what our approach to working with nonprofits is. This is uh, what I think it's, it's fairly unique. There are only a couple of other clinics like this in the entire country. Um, none exactly like it. And we're doing some really great things. <coughs> so what is it? Well, ServeIT, our mission is to empower local nonprofits with technological skills, resources that can help them actually fulfill their missions. Also providing IU students with good job experience, um, new skills, and that will translate into better jobs for you once you're out. So, how did this happen? Well, the initial idea was, happened in the, in the spring of 2010. Um, Maureen Biggers, who's one of our associate deans for undergraduate education and diversity, um, co-taught a class with our IU First Lady, Lori McRobbie. Lori actually was just given, uh, just this past, just two days ago, was named Bloomington Woman of the Year, actually, for her work with community service over the last year. So this is something that's, 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 that's you know, it's a great honor for Lori, and it shows that, that, that the leadership at the university is very much interested in, in working with, with community and, and doing the kinds of things that, that connect the skills of our students with needs that are in the, the actual community itself. And the idea was, th this was a graduate level class, and they, they started to look at, at how we were interacting with nonprofits, what their needs were. In a lot of classes, for example, the capstone class, which I also teach in informatics, you we, would, we might have a team that builds a website for, for a nonprofit, but then you, know, you work with them for a full academic year, and then you graduate. You're off to Accenture or, or Cyber or whatever company that you're going to work for, and you leave the nonprofit with this technology that within two to three years is now dated and needs updating. Or it might even be you know, sooner than that. But we give them some kind of artifact, and then we leave them, and then they need help again. So the idea was that we would develop this nonprofit clinic that would have this idea of tiered mentoring. We'll take freshmen through PhD, it doesn't matter. We like putting people together on teams that can go in, work with a nonprofit, look at what their needs really are, and work them, work, come up with a strategic plan for them and work through that plan. So once we do that, we can actually then retain that relationship with that client over time. If there's a, an issue that we can fix, we can go in and fix it pretty quickly. If it comes to the point where they need a new website, then we might need to put them through the process again. So in the summer of 2010, after this class identified the need and kind of built the original business plan, which has changed quite a bit, uh, but the, the, the founding documents are still there. Uh, I was hired as the director, so a year and a half ago. 
we got $28,000 from community sources. So this was grant from Community Foundation and from Smithville Telephone Company Foundation. And we also got commitment from the School of Rice Computing and from SPIA to really help make sure this thing moved forward. That fall, we created an advisory committee. Lori agreed to be the chair for that, for that committee and has done a great job of running it ever since. And we've got membership from a wide variety of sources, from SPIA, from Kelly School, from, from Informatics Computing, UITS, from the Office of Service Learning, uh, Bloomington Volunteer Network, United Way, Community <coughs> Foundation, City of Bloomington. So you're, you're seeing that it's not just IU people. Half the folks on the committee are outside of IU that represent umbrella organizations or the city or something along those lines. So we get really good advice.